Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. We're going to wait just another minute to let some other folks funnel in, and then we'll begin today's discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to the latest installment of Homeroom with Education Leaders, Reconsidering School Choice in the Wake of COVID-19. My name is Jessica Au, and I'm a Senior Policy Analyst on our K-12 team at the Hunt Institute. For those unfamiliar with the Hunt Institute, we were founded by four-term North Carolina Governor Jim Hunt and serve as a resource for policymakers on education issues across the education spectrum through in-person and virtual convenings, research and other forms of technical assistance. And so before we get the conversation started, I did wanna provide some brief logistical remarks. So first we'll start the discussion with about a 30 minute moderated discussion with our panelists, and then we'll pivot to a Q and A with the audience. And so if you have any questions throughout the discussion, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to address them during the discussion. Um, additionally, we'll record this conversation. The, record is, the recording is going now, um, and so we'll post it on our YouTube page for folks to view afterwards. Um, and so for those attending today's discussion, we're, we also encourage you to share the conversation on social media using the hashtag edhomeroom. Okay, and let's get started. So it's no surprise that the COVID-19 pandemic really caused a range of unprecedented and monumental shifts to K-12 learning and instruction, um, including a significant increase in parent and family involvement in their child's education. And so one result of this new engagement and awareness is really renewed attention on school choice policies um, and the options families have to customize education um, in a way that they're um, child receives it. And so our discussion will focus on how perceptions and policies um, around school choice have shifted as a result of the pandemic, um, as well as uh, the short and long term impacts of these shifts in education at large, um, as well as how policymakers and educators at all levels um, can really provide parents and families with access to the information, resources, and supports needed to ensure their children are receiving a high quality education that meets their needs. And so today, um, we'll hear from professionals who understand the policy intricacies um, and current market trends around school choice um, and how policymakers can make the process more equitable for all families. Um, and so those voices are those of Commissioner Frank Edelblue uh, and Letha Mohammed. And unfortunately, Julie Squire could not join us today, um, but we do have her colleague Alex Spurrier with us on her behalf. So welcome, Alex, as well. Um, so Commissioner Adelblue is the New Hampshire Commissioner of Education and represents the public interest in the administration of the department. Um, in his role, Commissioner Adelblue serves on a number of boards, including as a trustee for the University System of New Hampshire, um, an ex officio trustee for the Community College System of New Hampshire, um, and is a member of the National Assessment Governing Board, among many other roles. So welcome, Commissioner. Thank you. Happy to be here. Letha Mohammed is the Director of Education Justice Alliance, an organization that works to dismantle the school to prison and school to deportation pipeline in Wake County Public Schools and other districts in North Carolina. Um, as director, her work includes engagement and leadership training with parents, families, and community members um, to ensure that they know their rights and how to advocate for themselves and their students. And so Letha represents EJA on the Coordinating Committee of the National Dignity in Schools Campaign um, and serves as co-chair of their fundraising and finance committees. Um, Letha is also a member of Muslims for Social Justice and on the steering committee of the movement to end Islamophobia and racism. Thank you for being here, Letha. Thank you for having me. And then last but not least, we have Alex Spurrier, a Bellwether Education Associate Partner in the Policy and Evaluation Practice Area. Um, prior to joining Bellwether, 
uh, Alex worked as a senior data analyst at the Kentucky Center for Statistics, conducting research and working with partners from early childhood, K-12, post-secondary, and workforce organizations to help them utilize longitudinal data for program improvement. Thank you all for being here with us today. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. And with that said, let's jump in. Um, so Alex, let's start with you. Um, Bellwether recently released a report around the expansion of school choice, not just you know, in terms of increasing options like charter schools and vouchers, um, but in the expansion of how we think about uh, what school choice is. And so can you share with us some of those findings um, from Bellwether and speak to how the evolving concept of school choice is impacting education as a whole? I'd be happy to. So first off, thank you for hosting this conversation today. I'm eager to hear from my co-panelists. Um, so I'll start off just setting some context for the report that we released called Expanding Educational Options. Um, obviously, the pandemic has had a significant impact on the education of, of kids in our country. Um, and it's an impact that hasn't been felt evenly across our student population. Uh, we know there's been a disproportionate impact on uh, students who are in lower income communities. Uh, as well as a, a very uh, disproportionate impact on Black and Latino students. Um, access to in-person instruction during the pandemic varied significantly across the country, and those students who had less access to in-person instruction uh, saw greater declines in ELA and math performance. And so while this is happening, parents have had a pretty big shift in how they think about K-12 education. So for three consecutive school years, parents have had to answer three questions. One, what does my kid need? Two, what options do I have? And three, how can I make the best choice for my kid? And parents were having to consider those questions um, in an environment that they had never had to, to navigate before. And so for some families, it led to them making changes. Um, some made moves within the existing traditional public school system, either through uh, applying to a magnet school or a charter school. Maybe they got a U-Haul van and moved to a different school district or even a different state. Some families enrolled in a private school. Um, and we saw a, a surge in homeschooling during the pandemic. So a lot of families were making big moves in their kids' education, but we also saw families making much more incremental changes in how their kids receive education. So uh, we saw uh, kind of this uh, trend in learning pods that evolved over the course of the pandemic where some families were using that as their primary mode of instruction, maybe in the early days of the pandemic. And we saw lots of families using them as a way to supplement the education that they were getting from their traditional school, be it uh, public or, or private. Um, we also have seen a lot of parents hire tutors or engage in uh, smaller scale learning options, maybe through uh, programs like OutSchool uh, or, or other opportunities like that. And so, on the policy side of things, we've already seen policymakers respond to some of these shifting demands that parents had. So we saw three major trends in state policies along these lines. One, we saw a lot of new and expanded private school choice programs. So voucher programs, tax credits, scholarships. Um, at the state level, we saw a lot of programs either um, get more funding, expand eligibility, or the creation of new programs entirely. Second, we saw states move to make existing options more accessible to families. So we saw um, different efforts to improve information that was uh, getting to families to help them better understand the options that were already available to them. We also saw some states work to reduce barriers to access for families to, to get existing options for their kids. So addressing things like transportation. And then finally, we saw uh, some new programs um, and expanded programs to fund or support flexible learning options. So uh, we've seen a real rise in education savings accounts, which give parents funding that is a little bit more flexible to use than a, a school voucher that allows them to purchase educational services or materials to support the education of their child. We also saw some states pass laws to protect um, learning pods from being regulated as traditional schools um, so that um, those could that innovation could thrive uh, unabated by uh, traditional school uh, regulations. And so as we start to see this more diverse ecosystem of educational options emerge, um, there are still plenty of barriers that will need to be addressed to ensure that these are accessible in an equitable way for families. So um, three things that we've kind of flagged as challenges for the field to consider and address are 
first informational challenges. So how are we helping parents to understand what options they have available to them, how they can access them, and which options are going to meet the needs of their children? Second is working on logistical barriers. So if parents do want to take advantage of different options other than the school to which they are residentially assigned for their child, how are they going to get their kid to that option and back home safely? And then uh, third, there are just going to be a lot of data challenges that are going to arise as kids engage with multiple education providers. How do we ensure that those learning experiences that happen outside of the walls of a school are reflected on a student's academic record or their transcript? Um, and that, that challenge grows exponentially as more providers get involved in the uh, educational experience that a child has. So that's the, uh, the, the broad um, takeaways from our report and uh, I'm eager to hear from our, our other panelists on this front. Thank you so much, Alex, for sharing those really interesting findings, and really level setting for us about the data and policy trends surrounding student and family impacts and also the growth of choice programs, particularly in recent years. Um, moving on to a question for you, Commissioner. Um, in 2020, you started a program in New Hampshire called Learn Everywhere. Um, and this program allows any public or private organization in the state uh, to apply to offer high school credits to students. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about this program and what prompted you to create this option, um, as well as what goals you hope to achieve for students in your state? Sure, happy to discuss that. And again, uh, greetings to my fellow co-panelists. And Jessica, thank you for hosting this. Um, Alex, that was wonderful listening to that summary of the report. I can't wait to get my hands on it and actually read it at this point in time, because um, it sounds very, very interesting. Um, so the Learn Everywhere program is one of a number of choice options that we have here in New Hampshire. We uh, try to embrace the philosophy that um, all of our learners are different and have unique needs and have to find their pathways to success. Um, while it is true that uh, there was a lot of launching of Learn Everywhere in 2020, the actual effort started pre-pandemic. Um, and I, there's a... See ...hustling around doing different things. Um, some were, you know, programming their robots in Java to get their robot to navigate through a particular course. Um, I went to the back room and there was a um, kind of a shop set up and there were students working with two engineers from Bosch Corporation actually building and working on the robot. And as I was kind of finishing up my tour, I, I still am not sure why I was there so late in the evening. Um, but I'm finishing up my tour and there's a young lady who is kind of the captain of this robotics team and she says, Commissioner, you have to help us. The school is going to close at 10 and we need the school to be open to 11. And my first thought was, you know, ding, I win. These kids are begging me to keep the school open. How often does that happen? But my second thought was one of these poor kids are going to go home at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And then they're going to do two hours of homework because the all of this learning that has been going on, the coding, the engineering, the leadership, the business of sponsoring this team, that doesn't count for learning. Um, and so that really was kind of the genesis behind Learn Everywhere to say, you know what, children are learning all the time. Like learning is not limited from 7.30 to 2.30 inside the four walls of a school building. And so how do we capture that? And one of the things that's a little bit unique about this program, and, and I think it sometimes addresses some of the concerns, Alex, that you brought up relative to these choice programs is, um, you know, typically when you're working on an education program, I refer to it as a build it and they will come approach, which is you have this great idea, so the adults, I should say, have this great idea for programming for children, um, and they design it and then they try to attract children to come into that program. In Learn Everywhere, what we do is we basically try to figure out where are our children congregating, and then we go to the place where they're congregating and try and understand what is it that they're learning? And it may be that there's something in that learning process that we can grab hold of and use towards credit. And so essentially, we're not having to go out and find the students. Um, it, it reduces the risks associated with the access to the programming and the barriers because it turns out that um, you know children in poverty and children not in poverty tend to congregate in various areas. And so you know in that sense, we've overcome it. Whether it's uh, you know at a boys and girls club or a you know, New Hampshire Institutes of Science or the Seacoast Science Museum. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for students to be getting together and working on things. And we're just trying to capitalize on that and figure out how we can make it work. What's interesting too, Alex, you talked about the, the, the importance of overcoming that barrier of credit. Like, how do you recognize this credit? And how do you, how do you make it fit in existing systems and so recognizing that that was a risk, I think you've properly identified that as a risk. Um, in the Learn Everywhere program, students earn what I refer to as credit certificates, right? It's like a coupon that they can trade in for credit at their particular high school. So if they're participating in you know, a Boys and Girls Club theater arts program and they're getting a theater arts credit, uh, that then they can take that credit, they get a credit certificate and they get to redeem that credit at their high school for um, you know, the actual high school credit. So we don't have to get involved, we don't inject ourselves into that transaction. They're still go using the existing infrastructure for the, uh, the accumulation and the recording of those credits um, as they go through that process. So um, you know, that is another barrier that we've kind of overcome because the students are already congregating there. We've already overcome the barrier of how do they get there because somebody's already figured that out, quite frankly, before uh, the whole process started. So it just allows it to kind of accelerate a little bit more easily in terms of moving students forward. And the other thing that I like to think about when I think about Learn Everywhere is, you know, there's two other aspects that I want to highlight. There's a lot of aspects that I could highlight, but um, one is from a student standpoint, it's not a zero sum game. It's kind of a both and solution. So, and one of the stories I like to talk about is a you know a student who is you know a a, a blossoming cellist, right? Or and and they are just practicing you know after school for five hours, you know because they just love this instrument and they just really want to be able to to play on it. So they can earn that credit you know, for all of that work they're doing outside of the traditional school environment. But then when they come back to school, if they want to participate in the choral program, they can. If they want to participate in the, uh, you know, the band program, they can do that as well. Or let's say because they're practicing so much after school, it's really hard for them to get to their homework. Maybe they just have a study hall during that period of time and they're able to get caught up on their homework so they can practice more when they get after school. And then the other element that I think is important to this is kind of the ecosystem that it drives for innovation for our educators. Um, oftentimes we hear from teachers uh, that express a degree of frustration. They got into teaching because they really just wanted to open up worlds to children. They're really motivated to unlock the potential in children, but sometimes it feels like the bureaucracy of the rules and the system make it very difficult for them to do that. And so what I often tell them, if, you have, if you're teaching physics from 7.30 to 2.30 um, and you feel like you can't really get, you know, I don't know, to unlock your potential because of all the rules and regulations, then maybe you need a physics club from three o'clock till the late bus. And you can design your own physics program the way that you think kids ought to be learning uh, physics and you can engage them that way. So it creates kind of this entrepreneurial ecosystem for our teachers to be able to really um, find their opportunity to express that passion and engage with students in a really meaningful way. So it's really, it's, it's kind of a blank slate in the sense that there's a lot of opportunity um, across Learn Everywhere. And again, just one of you know, the many, you know, choice types of programs that we work with here in New Hampshire. Um, and then just one other thing I kind of want to weigh in on, I don't know if I'm over time, I don't think, I think I'm doing okay here, but uh, is, and I think Alex, you kind of, uh, you know, mentioned this, but it's just, the, and, or, and I know Jessica, you did, just the family engagement resulting from the pandemic. Um, you know, we all knew before the pandemic, and we, when we had engaged families, that they, the, those students had better outcomes. It was an excellent opportunity for students to succeed. And so my hope is that we can continue to nurture that family engagement, not allow it to dissipate and just really take advantage of the fact that, that we have new partners in our education work here. And I hope that they, they're willing to stick around with us. Great, thank you so much, Commissioner. And appreciate you sharing the work that you're doing in New Hampshire and also speaking really to both that student and teacher perspective of these types of programs. Um, moving to a question for you, Lisa. Um, as we know, uh, choice options are not necessarily accessible for all families, particularly families of color, um, due to a variety of reasons, um, including historical and, and ongoing uh, disenfranchisement and marginalization of these populations. Um, how can policymakers and education leaders ensure that school choice is available to all families and that options are available to serve all students' needs? 
Okay, great question. And I um, just want to say I'm looking forward to looking at New Hampshire's plan. Uh, it's the first I heard of it, and it's very intriguing, and as well as um, reading Bellwether's report. Um, I have to always say, you read a little bit of my bio earlier, and, and one thing I always um, make sure I mention whenever I'm speaking, right, to frame the words that I'm going to um, share is that first and foremost, um, I'm a mother um, of public school students. My youngest uh, son is 15 and he's the last one uh, finishing up 10th grade next week. Um, and then I have two daughters, one's 23, who just had our first grandchild. So I'm also a grandmother of a future public school student. It's a beautiful place to be. Um, yeah, it makes me really happy. And then my 18 year old is finishing up her first year in college. Um, and so being their mother and navigating through public schools actually brought me um, to this space um, to be lucky enough to lead an organization like Education Justice Alliance that centers the lived experiences of parents and students from black and brown communities uh, who oftentimes uh, don't have access uh, to what they need to understand how they can push back um, on a system and help transform it. And so thinking about your question, um, Jessica, you know, I think whenever we talk to policymakers and education leaders, sometimes the families, no, not, I won't say sometimes, oftentimes the families that I work directly with are left out of that conversation. And so what happens is that we have people in positions of power who can make decisions, um, who make decisions, um, who oftentimes make assumptions about the communities that I am a part of, um, about what it is we need in order to um, our students to be fully actualized in our education spaces. And so um, my first comment, right, to anybody, whether you're an educator in the classroom or a principal in a school or, you know, a district personnel or a school board member or a county commissioner, my first um, response would be create space for folks who don't normally show up, who can't normally show up to have conversation and weigh in on what they need in order to be able to um, be fully actualized in our public education uh, space. And then, you know, that's, that's a big ask, right? And sometimes we don't know how to do that. And so I say, if you don't have an inroads to connecting with those families, so then look in your communities, in your state, in your city, to find out what organizations are engaged with those families, and you can connect with those organizations first. And, you know, if I ever, whenever I get a school board member or a policymaker that comes knocking on my door um, about a particular issue as it relates to public education, I'm always saying, well, how about let's talk to our families? How about let's talk to our students? Um, you know, I think, Unfortunately, we live in a, a place that sometimes the loudest of us are sometimes those of us who are able, who have the privilege and the access to show up in spaces, um, will get watered first, um, will get listened to first. Their opinions and ideas is, is what we will often use to lead conversations and, and make us design um, choice programs, right, that fit to um, folks' need. And I'm saying there, there are people in our, in our communities who care about public education and want options, especially in light of COVID, right? I can't tell you, you know, how many conversations I've had with our parents around um, what some of the barriers were for them, um, trying to navigate, you know, online learning and even returning back to school, because everybody wanted to be back in school, right? But there were um, real hard conversations and choices around how do we create a safe environments for our young people to return to? Um, how do we make sure that there are protocols in place to uh, protect them? And I did conversations with my parents and, and then we shared that with our school board. We shared that um, with our um, uh, administrative folks at our central office in order to help them understand what some of those needs are. And so I, I just always go back to that, right? Like carving out space, creating space to hear from folks who are most marginalized. We can look at numbers, <laughs> data will tell us who's missing, who's, who's being left behind if we wanna use that as a, a, a way to find the folks. Um, but I, I just push policymakers to then 
do the actual work to, to get to those communities so that you can hear the per perspective of parents and families and students about what they need in order to be successful and what choice really means for them in the context of public schooling. Thank you so much, Letha, and appreciate you sharing your experiences and your perspective. Um, so before I move on to the q and I did first want to remind the audience to send in any questions that you may have um, in the Q&A feature. Um, but before that, I did want to move on to a last question from me um, before we start that Q&A for the three of you to answer. Um, so as we have seen, the shift to virtual learning and work really led to that increase, as we have mentioned, um, in family and community involvement in education um, over the past you know, two plus years. So looking ahead, do you think that this trend will continue um, as schools return to in-person learning, um, as well as the fact that parents and guardians return to their offices? Um, so how can states, districts, and schools continue to intentionally and effectively collaborate uh, with families and community members to really meet students' academic needs? Um, Commissioner, can we start with you? And that's me. Okay. Um, so thank you for that question. So it was, uh, you know, the pivot to virtual instruction was one that got kind of forced on us. For those of us who lived through that, I don't know if Letha and Alex had the same experience, but I mean, it was like in a couple of days, we had to like turn a whole system from everybody getting on the bus and going to school to figuring out how are we going to continue to educate these, these students. And Part of the reason why we wanted to do that is because we knew that these kids are going to be learning with or without our involvement and so the question is if we wanted a voice in what they were going to be learning uh you know we had to figure out a way to connect to them and i think that you know across the country educators really did an incredible job you know in in terms of speed and just trying to make that happen for students <clears throat> excuse me and um and what we found kind of coming through that is that in New Hampshire, anyways, and in fact, I was just really recently looking at some data, about 10 to 15% of the students actually thrived in that environment. You know, for many students, and we can see it in some of our results, you know, they did not thrive in that environment, whether it was through the mental health issues that they were struggling with because of the isolation that they experienced, or whether it was the inability to effectively engage their academics. And so I want to talk about them in a moment. But for, their, for a certain percentage of our populations, we saw social anxiety going down. Uh, we saw students who were able, when you gave them agency over their schedule, because oftentimes the virtual learning had a greater degree of agency in the students, they appreciated that. They liked the ability to set their schedule, figure out you know, when they were gonna work on stuff, to be able to say, if I wanna linger on a particular subject longer, they had the ability to do that. So a lot of positive instructional benefits came out of that. The flip side of that was that we had many parents who had to go to work and that was disrupted and it was simply unsustainable, right? It was just not gonna work, particularly for our littles. Um, and so you saw that side of it. And so one of the things we're trying to do is figure out how do we allow some of those benefits to carry forward and recognize how do we you know, not necessarily um, allow those negative things to, uh, to implement or to impede the ability to go forward and just, say we're gonna to have to just like snap back to and do things the same way we've been doing it for a really long time. And I'll, I'll just, I'll refer to one of the, the things that we're working on. Alex, you had mentioned pods. So pods is something that we are doing here in New Hampshire. Uh, we did it in the pandemic and we're continuing some of that programming at this point in time. But for example, one of those pod opportunities is around a learning center pod. And so in a learning center pod here in New Hampshire, we've got a virtual charter school, virtual learning academy charter school. Um, we have about 12,000 students take advantage of that particular um, online charter school. And so what we're doing is we're going to those charter school families and we're saying like, would you be interested in a learning center? And what a learning center is, is an opportunity to continue to have the benefits of that virtual learning for those students where it benefits them. You know, the autonomy, the ability to engage their schedule at their own, on their own pace. Um, but the flip side of that is they have a center so that they're meeting in a spot they do have kind of the socialization with the other students who are there. It's not something that you have to be there five days a week. Maybe you're gonna be there two days a week at that learning center. Maybe you're gonna be there three days a week. When you are at the learning center, there's opportunities that we are able to create that allow you to collaborate with some other students. So the goal is to try and capture the benefits associated with some of that virtual learning that we experienced as a result of the pandemic, 
and allow that to carry forward, but trying to find ways to shed some of the downside risks associated with that. I don't know if that helps. Very helpful. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Alex or Lisa, do either of you want to jump in on this? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I, I think one thing that we, we've got to keep in mind is that, um, you know, at Bellwether, we've been doing a lot of work aggregating polling that's been done of parents and, and what their views are on K-12 education. And if, if you look at the top line numbers, uh, when parents are asked if they're satisfied with schools, for about 20 years or however long Gallup's been tracking it, it's been about 75%. It really hasn't budged that much. But when you dig a layer deeper and ask what parents are concerned about for their kids, you know, majorities of parents are still worried about their kids falling behind academically. They're worried about their, their social and emotional development. And what we've seen is that parents aren't necessarily blaming schools for having to, to the commissioner's point earlier, uh, having to have switched their whole education delivery model uh, on a dime and move to virtual and then manage the transition back. Parents have understood that schools were, were dealt a, a pretty crummy hand, that they've, they've shown some, some grace and understanding uh, up to this point. And I think the question is still open as to how long that will persist, given all of the very serious concerns that parents do have for their kids right now. So I think to the question of, will parents stay engaged? I think they will because of their the concerns they have for their kids moving forward. And I think the way that school systems and policymakers respond to those needs needs to start with listening to parents and understanding that there's not going to be one path forward that will help uh, every kid in every situation. The, the range and the magnitude of needs that families have for their kids right now are incredibly varied and it's gonna require customized solutions to meet the needs of individual kids. So listening to families, understanding what their needs are, um, and then helping them gain access to the options that are going to address those needs it needs to be paired with that. So, um, you know, to the commissioner's point, some kids thrived in virtual settings and, and would like to continue with that forward. Um, how are we going to navigate uh, schools or school systems offering uh, in-person instruction options and high quality uh, virtual options or options that would allow families to have their kid home maybe one or two or three days a week. Um, that's something that we've seen in polling that families say they want, but is really tricky to actually operationalize in a system to make that work with schedules and buses and all the, the logistical questions that, that get involved there. So I think the more policymakers and system leaders listen to the concerns and the needs of families and then tailor policies to, to one, not only serve those needs, but then um, where they are running into barriers, if it's, you know, application processes that are too complicated, or, you know, the, the timing of a, a school schedule and an after school program uh, don't quite line up. Those are those are challenges that may not be immediately visible to policymakers or system leaders, but by engaging with parents, you can help identify those barriers so that, it, um, you know, you can minimize them or hopefully uh, eliminate them so that families are able to access what their kids need moving forward. Yes, and I'll just um, hop in there quickly and say, um, I definitely think our parents will stay engaged. I think they were engaged um, pre-pandemic and the pandemic um, maybe highlighted or put a spotlight on that engagement. Um, I think I'll use an example. My kids had the uh, privilege of going to a, a beautiful school um, for elementary called Partnership by um, my son and my daughter. And that school had a philosophy um, that was centered on creating partnerships between families. And it wasn't from this traditional model that said um, that the only way you can be a partner as a family or you can be engaged is that you had to be within the four walls of the classroom or go on field trips. Because what we recognize is that there's barriers, right, that exist for parents to be fully engaged in that place. Lots of folks, and in particular, I'm thinking about the parents I work with, work jobs that don't allow them the ability to get off and be engaged in that way. But you could partner in other ways. You could partner by helping the teacher at home cut out materials for the classroom. You could pop in at lunchtime and be a, a lunchroom monitor, or you could pop in and, and read a book. Or you could show up after school, right, um, when you're there to pick up your kids but there's something that needs to be done and you, you do that thing, right, to um, be engaged. And so I think it's going to require, um, you know, our, our education field 
being flexible in a way that creates opportunities for our parents to stay engaged in a way that makes sense for them and to recognize that there isn't a, a one size fits all. And we gotta throw away these ideas and these notions about what an engaged parent is when they don't fit within a box, right? And so I'm always pushing back against these ideas that float around in regular society um, that says join the PTA and that's how you are engaged. And PTA spaces don't work for everybody. And so I just encourage us to be flexible and nimble. Sorry, got the call coming up. Flexible and nimble and um, think about what are barriers for uh, folks to engage and figure out a ways in conversation with them to remove those barriers. Because it goes back to my earlier comments, right? We can't make decisions for parents in terms of their ability to be engaged without having conversations with those parents to figure out what the barriers are. Thank you, Lisa. And I think that's a really good point. And I feel like one of you know, the silver linings that have come out of the pandemic is that education systems are forced to become more flexible and also stakeholders within that system. So um, appreciate all of your perspectives. Um, so so, we're so Jessica, to... can I just, I, and I, you, sorry, something that you said, I just got to jump in. Maybe mm -hmm. it's just making this a little more conversational too, but when you say schools have become more flexible, that's really an understatement. I mean, you have no idea how flexible we have become. So <laughs> yes, we are, we have learned flexibility you know it was it was there but it might have been latent to Letha's point you know what I mean and mm -hmm. so we're just it's coming to the surface to be flexible with our families yeah absolutely um so we're now going to turn to the audience q a um again if you haven't already sent in your questions and have any top of mind feel free to continue to submit those and then um, my team will collect them and send them over to me um, but we do have a couple in already so I'll uh, get started on those for our first question, um, it's kind of a two part question, um, but how does funding factor into this expansion of choice um, and how do we ensure that adequate funding is allocated to districts, schools and programs to customize education offerings and ensure that all students have access to the educational experience they need. And I start um, mm -hmm. funding is a hot topic in North Carolina um, with our over 27 year old um, school funding case, Leandro. And, and one thing I would have to like lift up um, when we think about using funding to expand choice that we first have to make sure that the funding for public schools in the ways in which it was supposed to be funded, that we're meeting those those funding requirements or, or we're meeting and then I think again, North Carolina, you know, we have a requirement for a sound basic education written into our constitution for all North Carolina children. So I always worry when I hear about school choice and from the perspective of moving funds, if we're not already pouring the adequate amount of funds in, within the traditional public uh, K through 12 space. Like we gotta get that right first and before we take dollars from that system and move it in a different way. Cause I'm all for school choice and I recognize, right? Our parents are parents who need other options and I believe we should provide that. But we also have to overwhelmingly make sure we're supporting um, the majority of families who may, and in my perspective, have to go through that traditional K through 12 space. Yeah, and just to, to build on that, it's, you know, I think every state has struggled to provide uh, fair uh, amounts of resources to all public schools in their state, uh, given the way we've historically funded schools, which is heavily reliant on local property taxes. Um, and we know that property values are not a source of equity across communities within states, or let alone across states. And so th there's a lot of work that needs to be done within the existing public school funding system, but also want to recognize that there's a lot of money outside of the public school system that parents are already using, um, especially upper middle class and affluent parents to provide additional educational opportunities and experiences for their children. So I think it, it's, a, it's a both and question of how do we want to improve how we're funding our, our public school systems, but also how are we getting more resources into the hands of families to expose their children to educational experiences and opportunities beyond the four walls of their classroom. We know that uh, affluent families for years now are spending thousands of dollars on music lessons or summer camps or other uh, 
engagement and enrichment activities that uh, families with fewer financial resources may not have access to. So I think um, there, there's a lot that we can do on, on both fronts to improve the ability of families to get their kids the educational opportunities that they need to thrive. And right now, you know, schools have gotten somewhere around, public schools have gotten somewhere around $190 billion in pandemic relief funding that's flowing through the system right now. And we'll have that uh, for another couple of years yet, but as families are leaving public school systems, it'll present a lot of challenges down the road. So I think one caution for school system leaders that I would, I would pose is to make sure that the temporary funding isn't going towards um, permanent uh, cost outlays for them, uh, because when that funding does dry up, it could create a lot of pain in systems where students may already be um, in a precarious situation. So I think that's, that's one thing that, that we've really got to be cautious of in the, in the coming years. So I'm going to just reiterate what Alex said relative to that. And one of the things that we encourage all of our LEAs to be working on, and even as an SEA that we're focused on, is to make sure that with our, sometimes I refer to it, that $190 billion as the COVID cash, uh, that you know we only get it one time and it's going to, has, turns into a pumpkin on September 24th. So we need to make sure that um, we're not setting ourselves up for a cliff effect at that point in time. Um, another idea relative to the funding that I think would is important to kind of consider to pull into this is, you know, our community partners um, are really interested in being engaged with our education system. So I think about, you know, something like a Learn Everywhere program, or we have another program in the state which we refer to as Work as Learning where at the state level, we're matching 50% of the wages for kids who are working in businesses, the businesses are kicking in the other half, and uh, creating you know, internships, credit bearing and non-credit bearing internship work related opportunities for students. So that's one way, um, you know, partners like, you know, that I think about, you know, the, uh, the Seacoast Science Center in New Hampshire is a nonprofit organization that is serving students already in a lot of ways. And so, and, and they're there, they're working with the students, the students are learning in there and they're happy to work with kids. And it, there's no cost barrier for those kids to participate or where there is a cost associated with the program, those programs are more than happy to step up with scholarship opportunities for the students who that might be a barrier for them, whether the, the barrier is trying to participate in the program or transportation to the program or something like that. So I, I, one of the other things that I think we spend some time thinking about is how to engage our partners in our communities to be participants in the education system. And in essence, what we're doing there is we're finding ways to kind of leverage our, uh, our state resources into education, even though they don't look like they're education opportunities. Thank you all for answering that. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, another question from the audience. Um, also another two-part question. Um, how can we ensure that small schools with access to less resources, for example, in rural areas, are also able to offer options to students? And I think you know, a couple of you had at least touched on this. Um, second part, we've already seen disparities in these schools being able to offer options such as advanced placement courses, dual enrollment options, et cetera. How can state higher education and business leaders help establish partnerships to support these schools? So I'll, I'll jump in right now. I mean, and there's a hundred ways that this question could go because quite frankly, it's a big question, but I'm going to point to a program that we have in New Hampshire. And, and we've got a lot of kind of dual enrollment program, you know, running star programs that allow high school students to be able to, um, you know, accumulate college credits while they're taking their courses. Um, in New Hampshire, you know, if we've got a small or a rural community that has difficulty getting an AP qualified teacher and they can't get somebody, you know, all of those programs are offered virtually into the school through our virtual learning charter school academy, you know, so any student in New Hampshire can participate in that way. But what I wanted to flag is a program um, called New Hampshire Career Academy, uh, which allows our students in um, in their 12th year, so as seniors in high school, they actually exit their high school a year early and are enrolled in the community college system. And then we keep them for what I refer to as an extended 12th year. Uh, so it's really a 13th year. And they exit after the end of those two years with a high school diploma, a, um, an associate's degree, an industry certification or certificate, 
and a guaranteed job interview. This is my, uh, we want to keep these kids here, a job interview with the New Hampshire company. And it was funny, yesterday I was at the Manchester Community College uh, graduation where we had students who participated in the New Hampshire Career Academy graduating. And so these are students, it was no additional cost to the K-12 system for these students because we, process, we, we enroll them in a charter school uh, to be able to do that. And the funding we have for our charter schools is enough to pay for the tuition at a community college. And so they graduate with that associate's degree and zero debt has been you know, completely at free college is really what it is. Um, and so those are the kinds of partnerships that you look for to be able to, to marry up and find opportunities. And I can tell you for students who are graduating from that program this year, they are going to work at employers and the employers are saying, and we will pay for your, you know, the next two years for you to get your bachelor's degree, right? So again, just those partners wanting to work with us and wanting to create those opportunities. So we just have to really be creative in terms of how we engage the, the entire community in the education of our children. Yep, and, and we're lucky enough in North Carolina to have some of those same um, uh, programs that you mentioned, Commissioner. I, my own children access the dual enrollment uh, program and through our community college, and it is um, fantastic. I think one of the challenges I find um, with dual enrollment is that um, there isn't enough emphasis placed on ensuring that all students, and in particular Black and Brown students, have access to that. Um, and so if you don't know about it, you don't even know that it's a benefit and something available um, for you. So I think there's work to be done um, across the country in terms of equity. But then I always I have to go back um, to the earlier part of the question and thinking about rural communities and rural schools. I, it always goes back to school funding um, for me and to how do we make school funding more equitable so that we recognize that our rural parts of the state, our more rural districts have access to more funding so that they can attract teachers so that they could actually have AP courses um, for students. I think um, a baseline for me is more equitable funding, recognizing that there are places in our state in particular in states across North, the country that have access and we think about property taxes being part of um, the fuel to, to fund schools that they have less in property taxes. So that means they have less offering and less access. So how do we then look at our state funding models to ensure that equity is baked into that so that we can give more to places that need more assistance so that we're on a leveling the playing field, no matter if I'm in the rural part of the state or I'm in a more urban area, I have access within our, our public school systems to opportunities that will shift um, my life. Like um, Commissioner said, like to be able to do dual enrollment is a game changer to get two years of free college is a game changer to come out of high school with an associate's degree is a, a game changer for young people. All, all great uh, solutions proposed by my co-panelists here. I uh, couldn't agree more on the partnership side of things where you know, the more alignment you can get between higher ed employers in, in rural communities and what offerings high schools have, be it through CTE vocational programs or dual enrollment, early college type programs, the more alignment you get between those folks in communities, the, the stronger um, outcomes will be for students. Um, and, and one particular uh, piece I want to emphasize on the, the opportunity and leveling the playing field side for, for rural communities, broadband access is still a very big issue in many rural communities. And I'm, I'm hopeful that some of the uh, 190 billion and, and some of the infrastructure money will go towards uh, abating some of those challenges that rural communities face, because there are so many uh, technology enabled solutions that have come out of the pandemic or some more widespread adoption that would maybe allow for a smaller rural community that wouldn't maybe be able to find a AP calculus or an AP physics teacher to come and, and live in their community. They might be able to provide uh, remote options for their students uh, to allow them to have a similar experience and similar access to uh, students in more suburban or, or urban communities. But I think that the, the broadband piece is, is just extremely important for, for rural communities moving forward. Thank you, those are all great points. Um, for our next question, and I think this kind of speaks to that flexibility point that we were discussing earlier. Um, while online learning was a challenge for many children, of course, some children did find that they learned better in a virtual environment. Um, and so as districts continue to make moves toward establishing 
permanent virtual options for families that want them? How can we ensure that those children have access to opportunities for socialization and in-person time with their peers? It's that menu of options idea again, right? Like um, my children went to smaller magnet schools in middle school that didn't have sports programming. So there was a, an agreement between um, a nearby or neighboring middle school that said young people from our school could actually try out and, and be on the team at the other schools. I think that same concept makes sense for me thinking about um, parents that opt into the virtual because that makes sense for their children. There should be a partnership with um, schools in their area where their young people are able to access clubs, are, are able to access sports opportunities, are able to be on dance teams. Um, so just so because you're not virtually or physically in the building, that there is the, the opportunity for you to access the, these enrichment opportunities that allow you to interact uh, with your peers in a face-to-face -face way that also actually help you cultivate additional skills um, and are able to socialize in a way that you know, only strengthens you uh, as a young person. And so, and Letha, what I would tell you is that that's kind of the ethos that we have on the ground here in New Hampshire. So by statute, you know, like your students, if we've got home education students, or if you've got a virtual school student and they want to participate, um, you know, they're allowed to, that's all the mechanisms are set up for that to happen. And so, um, you know, that's, that's a normal occurrence. So you may have a student of these 12,000 students enrolled in our virtual learning academy. Many of them are some of our, you know, uh, star athletes in some of the, the schools that we have, uh, you know, because they're playing on the sports team or they're in the debate club or they're in the band or some music program. So, um, you know, so I do think that, uh, I know here in New Hampshire anyways, that we do do that because I do think it's important. Yeah, and I think for students who want to pursue virtual education, there's there's still a lot that education systems and policymakers can do to provide kids with in-person learning experiences. If it is a, a, a pod or some sort of learning hub that they go to, that's more for enrichment that could be based out of a school or out of a church, a mosque, a synagogue, out of a YMCA, out of another community institution, finding more ways for kind of the Tocqueville and little platoons of our society to get more engaged in the lives of children and families, the more we can do to support and help those kind of organic connections across communities, families, and children to develop the, the better off kids that are choosing different pathways will be. Thank you all. Um, for our next question, this touches on, you know, some of those informational challenges that you all had discussed. Could you share any promising practices around addressing this challenge beyond awareness of available offerings? What kinds of support do families need to make thoughtful, effective choices for their kids? Yeah, I always, um, the, the model of go where they are <laughs> makes sense for me, right? So if there is a vacuum, a void in terms of, um, families aren't accessing the information that they're not getting it, if it's coming you know, from the district or the school to families, and you're not seeing a return or a response to that, I say, go where they are, right? We have community centers, we have community events. That's where partnerships make so much sense between um, school districts and school boards with um, YMCAs and um, your city community center so that there is a, a centralized place that you know certain parents gather in, whether it's at the Little League game or the um, Tiny Top basketball game or soccer on Saturdays. What would it look like to take the information to the community in the places that your community engages at so you know that they have access to it? I think for me, it would be transformational um, for our families because we don't always have the opportunity to track what's coming in. People's numbers change. <laughs> Spam is real on email. You don't get the email that came from the district. So, you know, I think it's important to be flexible and meet people where they are at. And so, Letha, I, I'm kind of curious. I have a question for you a little bit along the same lines. One of the things that we found is, you know, where the people are oftentimes is on social media. You know, we can find them there and, uh, and that's how you can connect with them often. And, and ditto to that. I forgot that one, you know, I'm telling my age, but social media definitely is, is a, a hot place to try to connect with parents um, as well. Yeah, and I think one thing that uh, could be an opportunity for um, third party uh, folks, maybe in the nonprofit space, 
is to build more tools that help parents navigate the, the vast array of options that are out there for families. And I, I know states and districts do their best to have uh, websites that make this easier for parents, but um, a lot of parents, their cell phone is their only internet portal. And a lot of those state and district websites, no disrespect to the commissioner, I haven't been on the New Hampshire website in a bit, but a lot of them are, are tough to navigate for parents on a phone. And so the, the more that there can be tools that are built uh, to meet parents where they're at on their mobile devices, I think will will help to reduce some of those barriers. But I think there are also moments um, when parents are engaging with systems in high stakes moments, like when a child is going in uh, and identified for an IEP. Um, there are states that have policies that will immediately notify the parent within a set number of days or at that meeting of the opportunities they have available to them if that state, for instance, has a uh, special education voucher program or, or similar opportunity like that. So um, you could envision a similar opportunity if you know a, a child's reading diagnostic is showing they have dyslexia. That could be another opportunity to engage with a parent to, to let them know what resources are available to them. So I think meeting parents where they're at, but then also taking, taking advantage of some of those high stakes moments in a child's educational trajectory to engage with parents to make them available uh, to, to make them informed of the options they have before them to, to serve the needs that their kids have. Alex, you'll be happy now I just checked my website. We are fully mobile enabled. I thought we were, but. <laughs> great to hear. That's great. Thank you all so much. I wish we could keep this conversation going, but we are at time. Um, so thank you, Commissioner Edelblue, Letha, and Alex for joining us for today's very engaging and informative discussion on a very important topic. Um, before closing today's discussion, I do want to turn everyone to our upcoming K-12 uh, webinars. Our next webinar will be next week um, on Thursday, June 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern, where we'll be discussing the importance of building robust professional development opportunities, specifically for educators who work with students with disabilities. Um, we, yep, my colleague has just dropped the, the registration link to the webinar in the chat, so feel free to register. We also encourage you to join us on June 23rd to hear about pathways to diverse school leadership and on July 21st to hear about why teachers are leaving the profession in such large numbers and how policymakers can really stem that tide. Um, so you can register for these discussions by going to our website and we'll also be in touch via email and social media in the coming days and weeks regarding registration. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you again to our panelists and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.